My name is Chris Neby. I'm the creator of the Mysterious China series. It is a collection of award-winning feature-length documentaries which showcase the epic cultural heritage of China. Given the recent events of March 2008, I believe it is important to clarify the political history of Tibet. Tibet is about half the size of Europe with a population of only 3 million. As far back as the 13th century, Tibet was officially listed as part of the Middle Kingdom in the maps of the Yuan dynasty, one of the most progressive Chinese dynasties. Buddhism, a religion that originated in India, was introduced to Tibet in the 7th century. Tibetan Lamaism is a form of Buddhism intermingled with Bon, the ancient indigenous religion of Tibet. Lamaism made every effort to suppress Bon for the centuries to follow. With the introduction of Buddhism from India came the Indian caste system in all its demeaning form. Rigid laws divided Tibetans in three castes. Each caste compromised three ranks. The first caste included the living Buddha, upper senior class monks and the aristocracy. Their lives were valued in pure gold equal to their body weight. The second caste included lower ranking monks, officials and merchants. The third caste was for manual laborers, women, butchers, blacksmiths, hunters, herdsmen and entertainers. Their life was valued equal to a rope of straw. The first caste made up less than 5% of the Tibetans, but they were the ruling class. They owned all the land, pastures, forests, mountains, rivers and lakes, as well as the bulk of the livestock. 95% of the Tibetans were slaves or serfs. The first caste enjoyed the right to enslave and to buy and sell slaves and serfs. In the eyes of their masters, they were no better than beasts of burden. For centuries, ordinary Tibetans suffered barbaric exploitation and subjugation, all in the name of a feudal theocracy. When discussing Tibet, it is important to realize that for much of China's epic 5,000 years of civilization, they were far more advanced than Western cultures. The Chinese were the first to invent paper, paper money, printed books, gunpowder, porcelain, cast iron, and the magnetic compass. During the last two centuries, however, China's relationship with the West has been tragic because of the oppressive colonial Western powers and Imperial Japan. Subsequently, for protection, China isolated itself from the outside world. The result is that today, China is still a developing nation facing many problems, but it is rapidly solving them with ingenuity and diligence. In recent years, official documents have come to light which expose the many plots hatched by foreign interests to carve off a piece of Tibet or split the entire western region from China. In the history of the world, it is arguable that no greater injustice has been recorded than the racist, criminal and barbaric treatment of China by the colonial, imperialistic powers led by Great Britain in the so-called Opium Wars in the 19th century. The population of China decreased by over 60 million in the period of these conflicts and attacks from foreign powers. China's population at that time was only around 400 million. In their ceaseless efforts to take advantage of China, the British, while ruling India, created a political incident in the early part of the last century and annexed a semi-tropical region south of the Himalayas. This area had been part of China since ancient times when this was a holy place for the worshippers of the indigenous Tibetan religion known as Bon. After declaring independence a few years later, the Indian government incorporated the annexed area into the new India. To this day, this border dispute remains unsolved and continues to taint 
Indo-Chinese relations. With British support and encouragement, Tibet declared independence from China in 1913. This claim of independence was never acknowledged by China as it had much more pressing problems to deal with. The Qing dynasty had fallen and the new central government in Beijing faced many problems trying to consolidate the rest of China all the while fighting warlords backed by foreign powers. It was in 1950 after ending the Chinese Civil War and defeating the Imperial Japanese Army that the central government firmly asserted its presence in Tibet. In 1959, backed by British interests, a revolt broke out in Tibet. The central government quickly quelled the rebellion of the rich and ruling theocratic elite, sending the Dalai Lama and his entourage of senior monks and nobles to India, where they have remained ever since. During those centuries, the Chinese central government had not involved themselves in the internal affairs of the despotic, feudal theocracy of Tibet. After 1959, however, the central government abolished all privileges of the Tibetan theocracy once and for all. An extensive land reform was enacted, providing former slaves their own land to till. Livestock breeding and herding was encouraged, a new economy built. For the first time in history, the majority of the Tibetans were able to take control of their lives and decide their own destiny. Tibet has been catapulted in the 21st century by far-reaching reforms and the creation of a state-of-the-art infrastructure with superhighways, user-friendly airports, and the famous Tibetan Express, which connects Tibet with the highly industrialized east of China and ultimately the world. The Tibetan economy has flourished and created fundamental socio-economic changes in this once impoverished and inaccessible remote western region of China. The harmonious coexistence of modern Tibet's daily life with the deep religious devotion of the Tibetans is a remarkable result of the central government's policies. It is very sad that once again outside powers are trying to discredit and embarrass China. Especially in the year of the 2008 Beijing Olympics, we should refrain from passing unfair and unjust judgment. The Chinese are joyfully preparing for the Olympic Games in peace and harmony. We must not muddy the Olympic Games with political intrigue. We should honor the wisdom of Confucius. Don't do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Study history, not the media. The truth is not to be found in a television broadcast.